Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, fourth edition of the CCD rounds about city health through the lens of foodscapes in Bogota. My name is uh, Nils Lund. I'm the global lead for Cities Changing Diabetes, CCD, and I'm uh, also the head of prevention and health promotion at Novo Nordisk. Cities Changing Diabetes uh, works to address urban diabetes, particularly uh, with a focus on the most vulnerable pe people in the cities. And our partnership has grown since 2014 when we started to uh, 39 cities today. This means that we have uh, many good examples of uh, good action and good research and good combination of the two that uh, we'd like to share with people uh, around the world for, for your inspiration and for your possible implementation locally. And today, this uh, fourth edition, we'll be looking at foodscapes. And you might think, so what is foodscape? We all know what a landscape is or can imagine that, but what is a foodscape? And I hope that you, within the next hour, will be a little bit smarter about uh, what foodscapes are and how they um, might be uh, help, uh, helping to, uh, to implement and, and design uh, policies in, in cities around the world. As you can hear, I know actually very little about it. So fortunately, I have two uh, people who can help me uh, talk about this. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Valencia, Director of the District Education and Health Research Center in, of the city of Bogota, and uh, Sofia Schuff, project manager from GEEL, uh, an interna international urban design and strategy practice. Sarah and uh, Sofia will introduce us to the concept of foodscapes and uh, how this research has been applied to Bogota in Colombia. They will speak for around 25, 30 minutes in, in total, and then we'll go to a Q&A session afterwards. And you can always, uh, you can already now, if you want to post your questions by, if you look at your screen, go to the right, there's a question mark, click on it, and then you, you can enter your question here. Then I will get it onto my screen and I will post them to uh, Sophia or Sarah uh, as it, uh, what is most applicable. But let's get started. And we'll start with uh, Sophia uh, Schuff from, uh, from Giel. So uh, please go ahead, Sarah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> please go ahead, Sophia. <laughs> No problem. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I'll just uh, share my screen quickly here. All right. Can you see the screen okay? Yes. Okay. So thank you, Neil, so much for this wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Sophia, and um, I'm a project manager at Gale, an international urban design practice. And I'm very excited to tell you all what we are doing as urban strategists to support equitable and healthy foodscapes in cities. And I promise by the end of this, you will understand what a foodscape is also. Maybe you too, Niels. <laughs> um, so at Gale, we follow three-step process to help us create a tangible strategy to achieve healthy foodscapes in cities around the world. Our aim is to identify and understand the interdependent relationship between the food system and the urban system, the urban environment. And with that evidence, we create a range of different actions and interventions to achieve a positive dietary shift for local communities and cities. Key to our approach is to understand how people really behave in the urban environment. And this is because not all people behave the same way and not all people can communicate uh, clearly why they choose to behave in the ways that they do in cities. So that's why we really try to study, study how people use the urban environment. The physical environment influences our health more than we realize. In fact, 10% of our health is shaped by the environment around us which means that it is really important for us to better understand how the environment dictates issues like food culture or dietary habits in order to reduce the health risks due to the food that we consume or how we consume food in, in our urban environments. So the environment that I refer to is what we call a foodscape. The environment of the foodscape is the intersection between public life so the activities that we engage in out in the public realm, public space, the places that we frequent when outside of home and work, and food places, which is all of the different establishments that offer the food that we eat. 
Our hope is that through our foodscape methodology and studying behavior in the foodscape, we can close the knowledge gap uh, between policy activities happening in the city and at the citywide scale, and also educational activities happening at the personal scale. So that's why we focus on the neighborhood scale in particular, where we can see that we can make a real impact in how people navigate their lives and use architecture and design as a positive tool or a kind of force of change in cities and how people access food. So we have a range of tools that we use to study how people engage with their foodscapes. Uh, we compare both qualitative and quantitative lived experience data with citywide data sets to better understand mobility or planning uh, systems that really set the stage of what we see as food insecurity or lack of food access in cities. And so we work with observations of people and their everyday beha behavior in the public realm uh, with food, how people interact with food or where they interact with food. Uh, but we also study and map the physical food places in a community. Here, we're really asking ourselves, what is on offer? What is the visual signals that are being sent by food places in certain communities? And how do they kind of meet consumers on the ground at eye level? But we also use a range of different qualitative activities like focus groups or interviews to see a community through the eyes of local people and really hear, hear from them first. Uh, this can take a lot of different forms. Uh, we've even been doing this kind of research during COVID in Bogota, which I'll explain to you, but also in some other cities in the US. And so this kind of uh, method definitely can happen virtually, but also, you know, we do it with social distancing outside and things like that. So we use uh, all of this insights and community level data to inform interventions and rapid change on the ground, local interventions on the ground. While we aim to create these high level strategies that can influence policy and have citywide impacts, we also know that realistically, when we're working in cities, we need to get started somewhere. And therefore we advocate for engaging interventions at the local level, hyper-local level, uh, that can inspire dietary change for local population or increase food access by working with different kinds of local food vendors. Um, so really bridging that local need with actionable on the ground interventions. And the key here is the tangible and participatory approach that I've been mentioning, uh, engaging with the community and then scaling up and informing policy over time. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project that we've been doing in Bogota in collaboration with Cities Changing Diabetes and the Bogota Health Secretariat. Uh, you'll hear from Sarah in a minute, but um, our team was uh, conducting this foodscape research over the last year or so um, across four different peripheral communities in Bogota. Each of these neighborhoods is classified as a food desert, so very limited access to food available to people living in these communities around uh, the periphery of the city that you can see here in this slide. Um, and here we can see an overwhelming number of young people suffering from malnutrition. Public safety is a really big concern. People spend many hours commuting from the periphery into the city center. And so we have this uh, kind of specific urban context on our hands that we tried to understand through our research. Luckily for us, we had a really amazing opportunity to work with over 60 uh, community leaders and volunteers and community representatives in these four neighborhoods. And during the height of COVID, they helped us collect lived experience data on the ground in the four communities. They did interviews and mapped, uh, you know, what the different food places are in these communities, talked to vendors and, and residents alike. Across the four communities that we were working, we aim to really understand how these different urban typologies are creating the urban food desert condition. Uh, from long commuting hours, as I mentioned, uh, to reach the city center for work, to a lack of local food markets and shops to buy food for cooking at home. Uh, despite the fact that 
Some neighborhoods are more dense than others. Some have a very challenging topography, as you can see in the second picture here, and others don't necessarily Certainly have such a bad, uh, bad and challenging topography, but there are many similarities across these different urban conditions that create this food desert setting. So I'm going to share with you some of the insights that we had. So the research found that local mobility systems and the daily patterns of people are not really in sync. Often shops are closed uh, by the time that people get back home from work and people are spending so much time commuting that they depend on food places that are only accessible near transit hubs and often that food that's on sale is processed food. One person had told us that they often only eat at work because they can't find the time to get their food before or after work. As I mentioned before, the challenging topography and a limited number of food shops is making transporting uh, food home for people very difficult. It leaves vulnerable communities more vulnerable and multi-generational living almost a necessity for many families uh, with those who have mobility challenges. But I think really important to the kind of international conversation around processed food is that we see that the where food is being sold, there's a prevalence of fast food and ultra processed food on sale. Uh, nearly 40% of the food places that we surveyed display processed food. Uh, and we know that when people see these certain foods represented around them, it starts to dictate how people's kind of daily habits around food is. And this really made us question, how can we celebrate traditional Colombian cuisine and make healthier food also more visible for people uh, in, in these local communities? And lastly, another really startling finding that we had uh, when we interviewed locals uh, in, in these four neighborhoods is that they told us that while cost is unsurprisingly a very big burden or barrier to accessing food that they need, it was also striking to learn that nearly 80% of the people that we talked to identified the quality of the built envir environment as their main barrier to eating healthy. So people are saying that their lack of transit or the quality of the sidewalks and the streets is really keeping them from eating well, which is really important for us as architects and planners to try to understand what can we do about the built environment to influence better eating. So with those uh, really rich insights, uh, in, in hand, uh, we were looking at the kind of culture, physical conditions, daily patterns and hopes of the communities that we're working with uh, to understand how we can create a holistic food, uh, foodscape strategy, healthy foodscape strategy for, for Bogota. And that strategy included intervention concepts to solve uh, two kind of big ideas. Uh, first, how can we bring food to people in different peripheral communities, how we can get food there, but also how can we shift the demand and the perception for healthy food? So based on those two big questions, we then boiled it down to six kind of key pillars or six strategies. And you can see them here on the slide. It ranges from safe routes for people to get where they need to go along these clustered food corridors to food identity and food culture, uh, to the third principle around the food that's on offer at transit hubs, ideas to support local food vendors and local food places as a real important role in the community, ways to fit into people's everyday routines, make sure that food is getting to people at a time that they actually need it and can access it, and also new innovative ideas around delivering food in these really difficult topographic settings, as I was mentioning before. So each of those pillars was then represented and presented to the city of Bogota with different kinds of uh, pilot concepts so that we could really show how these different pillars, how these main strategies can be implemented through rapid, easy to implement interventions on the ground. And another goal of ours was to show these pilot concepts in relationship to existing policies or programs that the city already has going on. Um, and so you can see some of these ideas range from ideas for these safe 
food corridors and supporting local businesses along these key spines in the city to other ideas around bringing food to people through evening time markets, you know, creating safe local places for people to get food in the evening or micro mobility options and systems for uh, transporting food home in these in these difficult settings. So with all of that said, and this kind of overview of the research that we're doing and why we're working with food escapes uh, and food systems uh, as urbanists, I hope this story can inspire all of you a bit today to consider why we need to study and how we can study foodscapes and also how we can use kind of new data sets and new metrics uh, to transition communities towards healthier lifestyles and do that through local interventions on, on the ground. So thank you for the opportunity to present and we'll get into the questions after after this. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Sophia. It's um, food and access to, to healthy food uh, is, is really uh, top of mind, I think, for everyone. And, and, and this year it will also be, uh, uh, you know, uh, we'll, the global uh, 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 there will be a global discussion about uh, food and food systems at the UN uh, World Food Systems Summit that will be held a uh, little bit later in the year. And I can just feel the, the buzz uh, amongst NGOs, civil society organizations, but also governments about what we can do uh, to, uh, to help to address that. And, and I think... Uh, I think we can, you know, we can all, all observe a, a, a food desert or, or the inadequacies of, uh, of, of a lack of access to food. But we really need to understand the problem to be able to solve it. And I think what you're doing is, is really interesting in, in bringing through that understanding that then can lead to action. Uh, but theory is one thing, but action is also important. And then it would, uh, I think it would be a good segue to, uh, to, uh, to uh, ask uh, Dr. Sarah Valencia to, from the city of Bogota, uh, to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, so how have you uh, used these experiences uh, that uh, brought, were brought about by the analysis into your work uh, in the city? Over to you, Sarah. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction. So good afternoon and good morning for those that are joining us from different parts of the world. My name is Sara Valencia. I'm the director of the Center for Education and Research here at the Secretariat of Health in Bogota. We are really happy to be one of the cities to be part of Cities Changing Diabetes. And what I'm going to present, and it was mentioned before, is how as a city we are going to and we are implementing some of the results that Gail uh, presented to, to us as part of this pilot of foodscapes, but also how we are engaging with this program of city changing diabetes through other initiatives so we can have a full view and action roadmap to tackle not just diabetes, but also to work on a metabolic diseases that is one of the key challenges that we have right now in the city. So with our program, we are engaging with local partners. Also, we are working with the academia, with municipal authorities, and just the Secretary of Health, as I'm going to show you, but also public and private organizations to change and to bend in the cure for diabetes. So these are part of the allies that we have right now, including Gil also. So a little bit of the context about diabetes in Bogota, and a study in 2015 shows that we have so far a point 8.5 prevalence of diabetes in Colombia. And also in the city and in our country, we have two different kinds of regimes for the health. So people can access through the public uh, regime, that is what we call at the bottom subsidized regime, and people can access also access to uh, the health system through the contributory regime, regime. So that is the people that work and can pay for the health, for health. So as you can see, uh, we have some, a lot of subdiagnosis in the subsidized regime. That is the people that actually lives in those food deserts uh, that Sophia was mentioned to you before. So we need to see actually what is the diabetes landscape in our city. So this is part of the challenges that we are working with cities changing diabetes so far. As many of you know, uh, the main factors that contribute to diabetes are 
non-modifiable factors and modifiable factors. So we are focusing in to toggle those modifiable factors as the nutrition, housing, and how to control obesity also, and how to provide a more healthy environment to people, and how they can also do healthy choices to improve uh, the food consumption and so, therefore the metabolic uh, the, the metabolism at the end is just not diabetes, but it's also other diseases that are others in food. So this is part of what is going to happen in the future in Bogota and in Colombia. We have a population of 55% lives in city, as we are expecting that 60 of the population will live in 2050. So we need to address this challenge right now. So what is the roadmap that we have with city uh, changing diabetes? in this moment. We are working in three different areas. First, we are working on education and through a strategy that is called the true of your weight. Secondly, we are working on research and this foodscape is one of the research projects that we have, but also we are doing a research project to study the prevalence of type to diabetes and diabetes in adult subjects here in our city. And also we are taking actions first, as I'm going to show you some of the results that um, Sophia presented to us are going to be translated into actions in the public realm. But also we have different public policies for eating, for healthy eating that are taking place right now, that are being discussed. And we hope to be implemented in the next years that is going to give us also a battery of public tools to address these challenges and also to adapt some places to implement the pilot. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of the education strategies that we have so far that is the true of your weight. This is a community intervention with a preventable approach when people can go to these bands and they get some measures about the weight, the fat around the belly, the heart pressure, and in that way they can also get information about how to eat healthy. And also it has some also games so that people through gaming can also learn more about healthy diet and healthy lifestyles. So we have 12 daily educational spaces coordinated by the Secretary of Health. Uh, and there we have two bands in some of these places. And we have a record of 56 people daily since in, in these bands. So, so far we have been working together for two months, so it can help us to spread the word and to have a more focus on um, education activities just going where people is passing by. So the other study as I mentioned is this type to diabetes and Jesus study. So we want to see in the first part and uh, how in 3000, um, seven uh, households, we have uh, people stratified to see if they have or they don't have the diabetes, but also we want to see in a qualitative study, how is their lifestyle and how is the food consumption and how that uh, qualitative studies can help us to understand better the habits and how it's related with not just diabetes, but also other metabolic diseases that we can find. And this is finally, the Gallup study that I'm going to focus and go deeper a little bit more. So as Sophia mentioned, there are a lot of challenges that we have so far as the neighborhoods, the landscapes that we have, the visibility of foods, also um, that people do not eat healthy foods in public spaces. The public spaces offered of food is uh, ultra processed foods. Um, so, so we need to change what is happening. And also we have other challenges that is just not food offered, but is the security in the neighbor, neighborhoods and the local dynamics that reshapes how people also behave in those spaces. So here I'm going to present how some of the pilots that were proposed by Gail right now are going to be uh, implemented by the Secretary of Health. This is one of the powers that these two have on this project that it's, it's a research, but at the same time as we have been working together with us, the public sector, we have the power to implement some actions and to work with different areas to, to tackle the problems that were 
uh, addressed and well identified by Gail and the team also in the field work. So, so this is really, really powerful as an, uh, as an example of uh, public-private um, collaboration. So first of all, this is uh, one way to promote healthy roots. And we are working with the Secretary of Economic Development. They have a program to offer fresh food and, mark, uh, and, uh, and products produced by local markets uh, and local producers outside the city. So the idea is to bring those products and to implement food routes, uh, perhaps at the daytime, but also progress that through the night when people is coming back from the work and they can have a uh, better offer of fresh foods, especially specifically vegetables that they can consume at home. But also we are thinking to implement some weekend markets that are really popular here in some neighborhoods, but bring those markets also to these areas so we can increase. And also because the program is, um, it's a direct relationship between the producer and the Secretary of Health, the price is lower because we don't have that many intermediaries that also increase the prices of the products. So this is uh, something that we hope to benefit people just on the offer, but also on the price that the food can have with them. The other one is a healthy diet starts with you. This is a proposal to be included in the guidelines of the collective intervention plan for the next years. So what we are doing is to work directly to work to, to those neighborhoods that um, and the stores in the neighborhoods that deliver food so they can teach people how to eat healthy. So when they see people buying a lot of processed foods, chips, cokes, uh, different, because that is unfortunately the, the, the offers that they have in so many of these local stores, they can provide a different alternative of what they can buy that they are offering to. So they became, they, they become a, a part of this strategy and, and they can teach and they have also this direct contact, contact with the people living with them. So this is part of the strategy. Also, we are talking about food culture, how we can change it. One is about the regulatory framework to increase, increase the supply of natural foods eliminating advertising of water processed food. And here in Colombia, we had a debate like months ago and it was signed finally by the president when ultra processed food has to be labeled uh, with the ingredients that they have and put a, a, a big uh, label saying the risk that it has was for health. So we are going as a city to support that and to and to uh, implement that in a, in, a, in a level that we can have a city and also advertising at bus stops because people living in these areas move basically on bicycles or on bus. So to see how they can adopt very healthy habits. And also the other strategy is food places, healthy neighborhood stores as, as I mentioned to you before, these uh, shopkeepers can also help with nutrition topics. And finally, that is part of the results of this, um, of this project is that we as a city are doing big interventions, urban interventions. So for example, we are building hospitals in the neighborhoods when this pilot took place. And when we socialize the results with people in the architecture department and the infrastructure department working on those projects, they immediately saw that these big interventions can also contribute to increase food um, to food uh, of better quality. So one of the ideas that they have right now when doing the designs is on the roofs of one of the new hospitals that is quite big in this area is going to have a garden because, but a garden going to be working with the botanical garden to produce local food for the people there. So this is a change in how a project was initially built. I was thinking just to have a green roof. But now the green roof is just not to have this action to be and decrease the the the, the humid and and the and the 
heat in the building, but also to provide food for the community and try to create a community within the hospital that can also produce their own food and to share and to create these educated spaces. So this is one of the other ideas and activities that we are implementing so far that is part of the results of this project. So this is all for me. So thank you for your time and see you in the questions. And what I really like about uh, the approach that 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 you have uh, is that you know it is that combination of of a policy framework yet very tangible, actionable uh, things plus the regulatory uh, approaches. It, you know, it is the green roofs, it is the access to healthy foods, but it's also the regulatory uh, approach about uh, uh, about, for example, eliminating the uh, advertisement of ultra processed food. So it's many things in one, and I think. When we look at what uh, what the WHO recommends, it's it is you know it's not one thing that would solve the problem. It's many things. So it's it's I think it's really interesting what what you're doing. So now we get to the Q and A session. Uh, also for people uh, online, again you will be able to uh, to put in your questions by clicking on the question mark on the right side of your screen. And then uh, and then post it to to uh, to me, and then I will I'll get it here on the screen. And as you type away, uh, um, I'll uh, I can sneak in a couple of questions here uh, in the beginning. Um, and um, I think I actually start with you, Sarah, in terms of uh, the experience uh, from from Bogota. If there's somebody online here sitting from another city uh, saying that, you know, I'd like to do something like that, what, what would, what would you, you be your advice in, in applying this healthy foodscapes uh, research approach and then bringing it into practice? Okay, one of our advice is to trust in these public and private collaborations and also that with the knowledge that you can get from this research and training your people your local communities to do the work with you, you can learn about more about what is going on there. But most importantly is that the results can be implemented in practice. So here is an example of how we work together in a research, but also how they're going to be used to transform some realities in food consumptions in the neighborhoods. So that's the most important part and the and the advice that we can give to any city is that once you invest or someone else invests on in research, take the results, appropriate those results, make it yours, and transform them in actions. And that can help you a lot to address the problems because as a city, many times we invest in, um, in research, but because of changes, those are just stored and never going to be applied. Mm. That that's my main advice as a city. Yeah. Implement it immediately. Don't wait for that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, um, maybe a follow up to you, Sarah. In in terms of, uh, so you did the research and then you implemented in, into Bogota. Uh, how applicable are the learnings from Bogota to, for example, Medellin and Cali? Uh, would they need to start their own research to make it a locally applicable, or are there ideas that you they can that you have made and are implementing that they can use? What is the balance there in your view? Okay, I must to say that this is a pilot of four neighborhoods that we knew in advance that they were food deserts. So the challenge here is to learn the methodology and to implement it in other contexts. Mm. So because here the challenges can be applied for other neighborhoods similar to the ones that we researched. So these neighborhoods are really characteristic of other in other areas like Medellin, Bucaramanga, and Cali. And I have been traveling to Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, and you can see neighborhoods like these ones all around Latin America. But when we are looking for neighborhoods that have middle and upper class, the best way to do it is to implement, learn the tools that these communities are working with us. We can scale up the research to have the conclusions to that specific neighborhood. Because yeah. as a scientist, I cannot extrapolate those results to a context that is different and we know that in advance. Yeah. So those can be my, my advices. Okay. 
Maybe I should uh, reframe this question to you, Sophia, because I know you also done research in Houston and uh, and in Philadelphia. What uh, what 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 are kind of the maybe the similarities and but also some of the differences in the research that you've seen in those three places and therefore you know what what action you are you are recommending uh, at your end. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great question because what we started to realize after implementing this project across you know cities that we think are very very different from each other have different culture have different urban conditions um but what we started to realize is that there's something um that is somewhat of like an archetype or a typology of a certain kind of community and while people or the culture or the context might be somewhat different the density can be similar or the type of mobility options available to people might be similar. And so what we ended up doing is actually making some a framework so that we can almost plug a city in to understand what kind of intervention might be most important in that kind of setting. So what was quite different in Houston, for example, is that it is not a food desert. People don't lack access to food, but rather it is what we call a food swamp. People have too much unhealthy food available to them and are living in a very car dominated, uh, you know, urban sprawl kind of uh, environment. And so the the interventions that become very relevant and important in a setting like that will be different than than what's relevant and and important for a context like bogota yeah. but we could see that there are quite a lot of similarities for example between philadelphia and the food deserts of philadelphia and and bogota and we could see that you know, systems like supporting local entrepreneurs and people who want to be food vendors, for example, uh, you know, small grants or opportunities to, as Sarah mentioned earlier, allow a vendor to really be the visible kind of connection or direct contact to the community. That's something that's applicable in both settings. So I think we learned a lot throughout this process about what is context specific, what can't be, mm. you know, replicated easily and what is uh, definitely scalable and, and replicatable. Yeah. Cool. I have a, there's a question here from uh, one of our partners uh, from Steno Diabetes Center from Paul about uh, social structures. And um, it, it, I'll pose it to you, Sophia. During your dialogue and interviews with citizens in Bogota, were they also encouraged to express their desires for, for social structures and arrangements to promote healthy eating? If so, how was that information handled by the project? Yeah, I think what, what you maybe mean, uh, or just if I understand correctly with social structures, it's really the cultural and, and social way that people yeah, in addition In addition to the physical ones. Other. Sorry, in addition to the physical yeah, structures yeah. that are, of course, you know, but 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 everything around. So you are right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we definitely did a lot of interviews. I think we conducted around 300 interviews in these communities. And of course, we were not only asking about, you know, the physical setting and how people uh, navigate, you know, with different kind of modes of mobility, but we we're also trying to understand what role does people uh, does food play in people's lives. And we started to understand in, in Bogota that, you know, people actually have a very intimate relationship with their families. They want to eat together. I think around 70% of the people that we interviewed said if they had the capability to get the right kind of food, they would cook their meals at home. Mm -hmm. And so hearing that kind of desire to be together, to be with the family, to feel safe in their community and to eat good food was enough of an indication for us that there's really something here about just supporting yeah. those those desires that are already existing. Um, so that that's definitely something that we could see is there's a big uh, connection between the barriers that the physical environment present versus the desires and hopes and dreams of people in in a lot of these communities. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, let me go to a question uh, from uh, Conrado. And uh, it's that's for Sarah, I believe, because you are responsible for implementing. So very inspiring the whole initiative in Bogota. Regarding the pilot experiences, how are you measuring the impact, uh, the in, uh, the outcomes? Uh, because I think all of us who live in a in a world where you uh, you know where you initiate pilots, um, 
you also held accountable for the outcomes of it. Uh, so, you know, what are what are your approaches to monitoring and, and evaluating? So, so also that that the city that is investing in in, in these activities, uh, you know, also feel confident that this is a good use of money. So maybe for you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, we were talking about that last week. <laughs> Basically, because we need to have a baseline of to transform these communities, so have some measurements. We have now the results of Guild who can give us this baseline about food consumption and these dynamics there, and to see if after the interventions we see the results and the changes that we are planning to see in, in each one of the neighborhoods. But something that we were discussing is that we have not just to, we, we need to implement another battery of baselines. Uh, measurements to see after all the results of the implementation of the activities. So yes, we are working on that. Our local mm. leaders are also working on that and they're going to do the baseline to see the, the impact of the activities. Yeah. Cool. Actually, here's a, here's a question from Bogota, uh, from one of the uh, the viewers. How can, how can we teach people to eat healthy? I'm from Bogota. And I know fruits and vegetables are cheaper food and available during all during the year, but people prefer processed food. Uh, so I think it goes into the core of the of the key challenge of, of foodscapes and and then how you are trying to uh, address it. Maybe can can I answer just from my well, perspective well, first because I'm I I think this is such an interesting question and. Um, one one thing that I keep coming back to, you know, we we are urbanists and we're working with, you know, the built environment, but we understand that something about how visible and prevalent fast food and processed food is, it becomes this very emotional connection to the visibility of these different types of food. And I think from our work uh, in the cities that we've been implementing these projects, um, that we can see that taking it away from education and bringing it into a place of fun, enjoyment, uh, delight is, is a way to really make some of that transformation happen. And so we try to weave a lot of those emotional values into the interventions that we suggest as well. So it doesn't become a, the doctor told you to eat your carrots kind of scenario, but that it becomes the most exciting and least expensive food available to you, the most visible food to you is yeah. also the healthiest. Yeah. But please, Sarah, I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, so we are trying many things here in Bogota. So because we have diverse publics from upper classes, having uh, available all the food and junk food that they can have, and also to people with less access to food. Here we work in different environments, like the home environment, the educative environment, the hospital environment, and the community environments. And each one of these environments has a different education strategy. So for example, just to give you two examples, one, we are working in the hospitals, teaching people how to eat healthy, but we are not doing that on the consult. What we are doing is implementing an art program uh, growing flesh, uh, vegetables like lettuce, uh, tomatoes, and people is growing that in a garden in the mm. hospital. And then they reflect about uh, how they can be healthier, eating better. And also this food is going to be available for some of them. So we have an alliance with the botanical garden to have these gardens in some of the units that we have. So that is one strategy. And the other one is in the in the educative, educative environment. And COVID was great because students were receiving the lectures virtually, teaching them how to prepare local with local ingredients, healthy food. And the grandma was there and the mom was there listening and, and were joined the con and they joined the conversation. So how arepa can be prepared, sancocho can be prepared, and how these traditional recipes can be healthier in some cases. So these are some examples of what we are doing, of course, sometimes it's not enough and it's not this big public advertising because we have to be sure about something. We are talking about changing practices, mm. no knowledge. We can know what is a healthy diet, mm. but we are not implemented that in practice. And changing practice is the most challenging thing in any edu educative uh, action. So we are doing that kind of strategies to yeah. see how we can change practices. Cool. And not easy. 
Uh, you know, I think when we look at ourselves, you know, uh, changing behaviors is really, really difficult, particularly if, if it's something we have uh, done for, for most of our lives. Um, here's a question to, uh, to Sophia, uh, because, uh, you know, you have the benefit of being in, uh, I'm saying it, but uh, maybe I mean it, mean it in a nice way. You sit in the ivory tower and you can observe the world and see all the best practices here. So the question from... Uh, from Saul uh, is that are there any examples in the world where developers are required to meet healthy f make uh, healthy food available um, uh, during building housing uh, and housing projects? Uh, you know what 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 is the good inspiration that uh, that uh, Bogota and, and others should uh, should look to uh, either in the region or beyond? Oh, that is, this is a very interesting question. I, I don't know if I've ever had somebody say that I'm up in the ivory tower. <laughs> oh, but you, but, can, you, um, can, you can watch the world think... from above. <laughs> yes, I guess so. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, I'm not sure of any practices where developers specifically are creating these conditions. I, I wish I knew of more and I would have implore others that are on the call to put a link in the chat if you if you know of some but we definitely have seen some fantastic representations of cities who are working with you know housing areas and integrating uh, different kinds of production into the city environment we see uh, Bogota uh, or sorry Barcelona doing some really wonderful things uh, by connecting the peri-urban landscapes around the city into the markets uh, and really democratizing the access to, to food in, in the markets around Barcelona. I think it's a fantastic model um, that we, we look to quite also often. And also I saw recently um, a friend of mine uh, had sent a link to um, a project that has been implemented in Rosario, uh, where they are also showing how more and more production of food can happen in uh, the city environment, which is just something that we don't see enough of. Yeah. But of course, with this conversation around food and health, we need to be thinking in this kind of co-benefits uh, vocabulary where we think about climate action alongside health. And I think uh, this project that I saw recently in Rosario was really impressive. I think it won an award through um, WRI, if yeah. I remember correctly. Um, but there's some good projects out there, but we'd like to see yeah. more uh, more collaboration with, uh, with the private sector yeah. and developers, definitely. Yeah. And sorry for using the ivory tower as a, as as the image. I didn't want to imply that you're removed from re from reality. You know, I think we 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 you know we we love working together with you because you are able to you know combine both practice and theory into something that is actually meaningful at, at the local level. So apologies for that. It was more whether you had. The, the 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 bird's eye view. Maybe that's a better picture uh, of that. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but but actually, uh, look, a question for you, Sarah. Uh, you know, sometimes when you work re with researchers, uh, and then they present the report, and and uh, and then you sit after the presentation, you sit back and uh, say, "Yeah, I knew that," uh, and you know, then you have it confirmed, and then you can go ahead with uh, with planning what you had intended to do in the first place. But but I'm just curious about. Uh, from your point of view, as you worked together with with Gail and uh, and through this research, but what what were there any big aha moments, so so genuine surprises, or or th things you had not uh, thought about that you uh, you know that made you take a new look at at, uh, at those communities and and what is uh, necessary to change? Okay. So first of all, I must to say that working with you was a really good experience because it was an open communication. They came to us initially with an idea mm. and we as a city had the opportunity to say like, you know, we need to identify these food deserts and these food landscapes in these neighborhoods when we see that we have a challenge there. And they were quite often to modify a little bit of the initial proposal and the places to get adapted to what we actually needed as a city to understand and to learn more. So that was really good because it, op it opens a dialogue mm -hmm. to build together the project. And the big aha, of course, took place when we saw the results about the topology and also the routines of people there and also 
how they were afraid to eat in some places the food that was there, and, and also how people connected with each other, uh, with the places when we thought that they would go for food, and actually they were passing by and they didn't consume the food was there. So this was part of the aha moments that we had because we have the leaders there doing the dynamics on working on health actually, but they were not paying attention about the consumption food routines. And when it give us those results, it can give us the idea how people were actually accessing to food mm. and the challenges of wow. challenges about the environment that that was really good for mm. us to understand better. Nice, very interesting. Um, that's also common online with just a, a generally a, a praise for for the work that you are you are doing and and uh, and uh, you know bringing uh, putting words into action and uh, it's a comment from uh, from the city of Houston that has also worked together with with uh, with Yusufai and, and Gil so uh, so praise there I I think they find it to be very uh, uh, relevant um, you mentioned uh, that uh, Sofia that much of the research was carried out during a, a period of lockdown um, and and you know that many of the interactions had had uh, been uh, you know been limited by by that or actually you said you you were actually able to carry carry through the research and and do the interviews in the focus group despite the fact that you that you, that you were under a lockdown but can you elaborate a little bit on that and 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 uh, you know what were the p potential shortcomings, or what would you have liked to to do uh, to uh, to maybe deepen the research even further? Sure. Um, well, I think in some ways, maybe doing this during COVID ended up being somewhat of a blessing because it forced us to pivot from a methodology that we know well and we've developed over a long time and. Typically, we would be the ones going out into the city and doing a lot of the research ourselves. And what COVID forced us to do was rather partner in a much more uh, intimate way with our local partners. In Bogota, we started meeting almost bi-weekly with the local uh, community representatives to really try to see how they could go out and do the data collection instead of us doing it. Mm. And what that meant is that they really built, I think, a different level of trust and engagement with the local community. As I mentioned before, we had 64 local people out doing data collection. And I'm not sure that's the kind of thing that we can always easily um, leverage. Uh, also in Philadelphia and Houston, you mentioned that we had done the projects there as well. We saw just so much engagement from the local partners to kind of plug the gaps from us not being able to be there personally and instead getting very, very close to the communities doing the data collection on site. So maybe in some ways COVID ended up being a bit of a blessing mm -hmm. uh, because it really, I think, forced us all to think of a new way on how to com connect with communities. Mm -hmm. And even since this research, we've already gone back to our kind of drawing board mm -hmm. and revisited some of our methodologies of how we interview or how we uh, kind of collect the more qualitative data and are thinking about how we can use some of the learnings that we've had from COVID to just implement them into these, mm -hmm. these methods. Um, because at the end of the day, the connection to the community, building that trust and and kind of understanding need, um, you know, it's a very context specific yeah. uh, activity. So, yeah, really interesting and and you know, actually a positive thing coming out of it. You know, both uh, yeah. greater ownership and capacity building also at the local level. So uh, we don't have to fly people around the the planet to uh, to solve for these things uh, as we go forward. Then there's. Uh, Maybe we're close to the last question here. Uh, um, I'll I'll send it. I'll give it to you, Sarah, because it's also uh, a person from Bogota, uh, Johan Dalian Ortego. Um, hi from Bogota. How do you think technologies and apps uh, can be help uh, helpful in addressing this problem? I strongly believe that there are some technological tools. Uh, that are pushing uh, a new culture of unhealthy food consumption, but maybe how can they, on you know, in a reverse way, be a, uh, be used as a part of the solution uh, rather than being part of the problem? Mm -hmm. A big tech question here at the end. The use of apps. Yeah. 
The use of offices is very important, but also we need to understand the public with which we are working with, because in some cases they don't have access to technology. So we have to address some challenges without that, that technology to to educate people and to teach them better ways to food consumptions. Otherwise, when we have the apps, they can be used wisely by us, for example, by the government also. The problem with the apps is how you engage and do you are prepared those ones on your daily routines and to change practices. So you have apps as like my fitness book, when you can try your food intake, the calories, the amount of sugar, salt, water that you are drinking and you are eating, and it can help you to have a better diet. But in some cases, the routine to keep those uh, those apps updated uh, mm -hmm. with your own information is what is challenging. So it is a determination of each one also to do it. What we are doing here in Bogota is to have, for example, in our website and our online platform, learn uh, Aprender Salud, mm -hmm. a battery of different lessons on like a, a diet basket. So you can build your own healthy basket and have a checklist to eat it properly. And when you go to the supermarket, identify what you can have and, and what you are buying and is healthier or not. So it was an app that we developed that you can access through the, mm. to the cell phone. But the challenge is to implement and to, uh, to be widespread through the communities. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a Nobel Prize uh, hidden there in if you find the the very good uh, healthy eating app and actually make it something something that you know many people will use for a long time. It is really really difficult to to make that bridge, and I can only you know talk about myself about how many useless apps I have on my uh, my phone that I'm not using, and and then they don't do any good. So, but. Uh, but I think that was uh, probably <clears throat> excuse me the probably the last question we'll have time for. Uh, so thank you, uh, Sari and Sophia. It's it's been a pleasure to uh, to listen. I learned also a lot uh, about what the foodscapes are, and I hope that that people online also had uh, you know had the same experience. Um, so if you have missed a point or two, um, this recording will be available uh, on YouTube in the Cities Changing Diabetes uh, channel. And uh, then you can you can watch some of the finer details and hear some of the answers uh, to some of the questions uh, again at a later stage. Or you can share it with your colleagues uh, or others who are interested in this uh, topic, even if they didn't uh, participate today. You can also uh, learn more about uh, foodscapes uh, and and go deep down uh, into uh, the uh, the research that we uh, that was done in in Bogota. If you go to citieschangingdiabetes.com under network slash Bogota, there you will find the, the, the report. It's, uh, as, I, as I recall it, a 50-page report, uh, very but very well, well written and, and easy to, uh, to comprehend. And there you can see some of the methodologies. If you have a question or two, send it to info at uh, citieschangingdiabetes.com and we'll pass on the question either to... Uh, so, uh, Sarah or, or Sophia, or maybe we'll even try to answer it ourselves if, if it's a question to uh, to me or others in, in my team. So uh, there's uh, ample opportunity to uh, integrate foodscapes into your thinking about the healthy city planning, um, and uh, I encourage you to, to do that. Um, the next uh, 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 CCD round will take place in October on the 26th, where we will be focusing on childhood overweight and obesity in cities. And uh, we will have uh, UNICEF uh, among, presenting, uh, among us uh, to present uh, their urban roadmap uh, for, for that topic. So all I'll say now uh, is just to repeat what I said. Thanks again, uh, Sarah and Sophia, for your contributions, your insights and, and your experience from Bogota and from the ivory tower. <laughs> or the bird's eye view, uh, Sophia. And thank everyone for listening in uh, and, uh, and, and seeing what we had to show today. So have a wonderful day, evening, morning, or whatever you, that is ahead, ahead of you. Thank you very much.